So this is another video that has been requested quite a lot, uh, especially after I sent some of these assassin bugs to Petco from the Dark Den. Quite a few people have asked how do you keep these giant assassin bugs, how do you breed them uh, and so on. So this is exactly what this video is gonna be about. Um, and some of you might have already noticed that the title isn't how to keep Sutala Horida, the giant spiny assassin bug, but simply how to keep assassin bugs in general. And that is because all of the ones that you can currently get uh, have almost identical husbandry requirements. So this video is going to be a general guide on how to care for all of the giant assassin bugs that are currently available. Now of course I'm not actually qualified to say the husbandry is almost identical since I only have kept and bred one species so far. So for this video I have contacted another breeder which does have all the available species and asked him how he keeps them. And he confirmed that yes, their care requirements are very very similar with just one minor difference that I'm of course also going to mention. Now if you want to skip straight to the husbandry, I'm going to put a timecode in the description that you can click on, which will take you to that part of the video. I'm also going to put that in the comments because no one reads the description these days. First though, I want to tell you why I think they're great, uh, even or rather especially for beginners, and then a bit about their biology because I think that's also quite interesting. Now some of you probably went to type an angry comment at me for saying they're for beginners and you're like, hold on, are you crazy? Don't these have like extremely painful venom and aren't they super dangerous? Uh, well, yes, I think they're great for beginners for several reasons, but first the venom. Um, yes, it's true that they do have a venomous bite and yes, it is painful. Very, very painful. There are no lasting consequences and it's certainly not deadly, but it's still very unpleasant. In my opinion and experience though, this doesn't translate uh, to them being actually dangerous in any way. They're not aggressive or even defensive animals. And as you can see right here, even when you do bother them, which uh, you shouldn't do of course, I'm just an idiot, don't do what I'm doing here. Um, even if you do bother them, they will simply ignore you or run away. The only way I could see someone getting bit by one of these is extremely stupid behavior such as trying to grab them, squeeze them or hand feed them. So as long as you're not a complete moron and you treat them with the respect that any venomous animal and actually all animals deserve, they're not dangerous in any way. Okay, now while well, I think they're great for beginners and by that I mean people just getting into invertebrates as a hobby. Uh, I'd actually recommend getting these all over a tarantula or a mantis too for two main reasons. They're communal and they're active. Um, by that I mean you can and should keep them in groups. Just getting one or two of these really isn't all that fun. Uh, if you get a group of around 10 or so though, there'll always be some activity in the enclosure. You'll always spot at least one or two, probably more though. And they are not strictly nocturnal animals either. Uh, in fact, I'd argue they're actually more active during the day, if anything. They also don't construct burrows or hide very much at all. So unlike many tarantulas, you'll pretty much always see them. And unlike a mantis, they'll also actually be doing things when you see them. Uh, now I know that these aren't great arguments if you're already into invertebrates as a hobby. But I think, especially for a beginner, both of those are quite important. Um, also, again, with a group of 10 or so, you'll be able to feed them every single day if you want to. Uh, feeding one or two crickets every day and seeing the response is something that, again, sets them apart from other inverts that you normally recommend to beginners. Um, if you just get one tarantula and you have nothing else, you'll feed it maybe once a week. And I can see someone getting bored of that pretty quickly. Also, the husbandry for these assassin bugs is extremely simple and they are just quite robust in general, but we'll get to that in a bit. Now, a bit about their biology. They are hemipterans or true bugs. 
Um, the true bugs are a big order of insects with something like uh, 50,000 species in it. And that includes a lot of familiar critters like uh, shield bugs, and stink bugs, leaf hoppers, cicadas, uh, bed bugs also, um, and a bunch more. Uh, what they all have in common is their modified mouth parts. Um, they all have these stinging and sucking mouth parts, which are called a proboscis. Um, now, most of them are pretty harmless. They suck plant juice. Uh, but of course, our assassin bugs here uh, went a different route. Um, assassin bugs or reduvide are their own family within the true bugs, and they contain around 7,000 species. And all of them, as far as I know, are predatory. Now, most of them are pretty small, and there are some really weird-looking small ones. And I've got some pictures of some examples here. Um, but all of them use their proboscis to puncture their prey, inject the venom that kills and liquefies it, and then suck it back up. And interestingly, they don't actually jam their proboscis into the prey. Everything that you see uh, from the outside actually also stays outside. Um, instead, their mandibles are modified, and they're in there. They're very long, often even coiled up inside the head like a spring, and they're very, very sharp. Um, and I took this picture of a dead one, and you can actually see the tips of the modified mandibles in this image. They're also called uh, stinging bristles. They use these to pierce through the exoskeleton of their prey, and they can get uh, through some pretty tough defenses, uh, and then they inject their venom through that wound through a separate venom channel. Um, and this is what cross-section through the proboscis would look like. Also, they have these uh, grip pads made up of tiny hairs on their first two pairs of legs. Uh, and if you're thinking, hey, that sounds familiar, uh, yeah, tarantulas have those too. Uh, now, of course, those two have evolved separately, and this is actually a great example of convergent evolution. Anyway, that was just assassin bugs in general. Now let's get to the ones we actually keep in the hobby. All of them look pretty normal as far as assassin bugs go, they're just bigger. Um, the species that I have, Psytala horrida, is probably the largest assassin bugs in the world, but all of the ones that are in the hobby are definitely above average size. Um, they all come from tropical regions in Africa, for example Tanzania, Uganda, Congo, Ethiopia and so on. Um, and they're all arboreal, meaning they live on trees. So, which species can you actually get? Uh, it might surprise you, but there's actually only three, or maybe four, depending on who you ask. First, there's Platymeris bigutatus, the two-spotted assassin bug, or white-spotted assassin bug. These are the most commonly available. They get to a medium size of around four centimeters. Then there's Platymeris levicollis, the red-spotted assassin bugs. These are not as commonly available, but you do still find them quite often. Uh, they stay the smallest at around 3 cm. And then finally there's Psytala horrida, the spiny assassin bug, the ones I have. Uh, they used to be Platymeris horrida until uh, they got moved to their own genus. These are, at the moment, still the hardest to get and most expensive of all available species. They're also the largest, getting to around 5 cm long. Uh, they're also a lot more chunky than the others, so if you have them side by side, these are really quite a bit more impressive. But hey, some of you say, didn't you forget some? Um, well, yes and no. You also sometimes see offers for Platymeris radamantus, but at the moment no one is quite sure if we actually have these in the hobby. 
They are very, very similar to Levicollis, and they might even be the same species depending on who you ask. Uh, so if you see any offers for Radamantus, be aware of that. Also, you often see Platymeris species Mombo cropping up. Um, those are most likely just a color form of Bigutatus and not actually a separate species. The color of the dots on their wings seems to be quite variable and goes from white over yellow to orange. Now these might still be a different subspecies and come from different areas, so don't crossbreed them, but they're definitely not a separate species, which is why I didn't list them as one here. So those are the ones you can get, a small, medium and large option, basically. All right, now finally, how you actually care for them. Uh, it's really quite simple as long as you set them up right. And this is the part that I've seen a lot of people get wrong, even here on YouTube, which then to leads to sad videos about dead assassin bugs. So when setting them up, you should be aware that these are arboreal insects, and like many other arboreal insects, they mold hanging upside down and eventually just hanging from their old skin to harden. And they need room to do that. The bare minimum you need to provide is a free space downwards that is at least three times as high as they are long. And more is always better here. Um, I'd actually give them quite a bit more and put them into something that's at least 20 centimeters or 8 inches high. Um, they also, of course, need something to hang down from to mold. For that, you provide some pieces of bark or thick branches that are leaned against the back or side. Uh, I like to use cork bark because it also doubles as a place to perch on for hunting and a height. With a setup like this, the chance of mismolds is greatly reduced and you won't get deformed animals that eventually die from their molting complications. Anyway, um, other than that, you want some substrate in there, just 3 to 5 centimeters or like 1 to 2 inches uh, is enough. Uh, and you want to keep at least a part of it moist because that's where they will lay their eggs. Um, what the substrate is really doesn't matter as long as it's harmless to them, so no chemical additives in there, like fertilizer. Um, I recommend keeping all of the substrate slightly moist, not just one corner, and adding springtails to it. Um, that is because these assassin bugs are very messy eaters and they'll drop leftovers where you can't get to. And without springtails in the substrate, this can get pretty disgusting pretty quickly. So you want to keep the substrate moist to get a healthy springtail population in there so it doesn't smell. Um, at least that's what I do and it works great for me. Um, there's no smell at all, in fact, except for the smell of moist substrate, of course. Um, if you're very diligent with your maintenance, it might work without springtails, but I'm way too lazy to try that. Other than that, you don't really need anything. Um, the other decorations are left to your imagination. You can put live plants in there or silly plastic, like treasure chests or whatever you want. Um, a water bowl isn't mandatory either, but you can include one if you want. Um, the sesame bugs get most of their moisture from their prey anyway, uh, and they will drink water droplets if you spray in there. Um, one more thing, I would give them light. Uh, it doesn't need to be a heat lamp, just LEDs will be enough, but they're definitely active during the day and they do have good eyes. So some LEDs on like an 8 to 12 hour timer will probably be good for them. Um, that's personal preference though. Uh, I just like to see my animals in nice light. Well, that just leaves the question, how many do you actually want to put together? Um, well, generally you can put in as many in one enclosure as there are separate places for them to hide and mold. Uh, they don't mind sitting pretty close together, but you shouldn't overdo it. Um, some concrete examples, uh, for example, in a 5.8 liter Braplast box, which is like 1.5 gallons, you can keep around 5 adults. In one of these uh, very popular 30 centimeter or 1 foot cube terrariums, you can keep 10, uh, maybe 15 adults. Uh, I have mine in a 40 by 40 by 30 centimeter terrarium, which is 16 by 16 by 12 inches. 
And I'd say you can put around 20, maybe 25 adults in there. Uh, all of those numbers are for adult Psytala horrida, by the way. You can add a few more for the smaller species, and if you have nymphs you can, or babies, you can also, of course, put a few more in there. Right, now the temperature and humidity requirements. Um, room temperature is fine in my experience, uh, though the room I have them in is quite warm. And, of course, the enclosure itself does heat up a little bit too. So I have them at around 25 degrees Celsius, which is 77 in freedom units. Uh, slightly lower temperatures are also fine. I just wouldn't go below like maybe 21 degrees or 70 Fahrenheit during the day. And now we come to the one difference in husbandry that I mentioned earlier. The Platymeris species have all been found in a variety of habitats, from humid rainforests to quite dry, more open areas, and they don't mind being kept quite dry too. So you really don't need to worry about humidity much for them. Just give them like 50% or more, which is like regular indoor humidity. The Psytala horrida though, uh, so far have only been found in humid rainforest, so they might tolerate drier conditions, but to be on the safe side, I'd recommend keeping them a bit more humid. I have mine at around 70% humidity, but of course that fluctuates uh, from like 60 to 90% in my case, and they seem to be fine at either end of that scale. And now lastly, uh, food. Uh, this is probably uh, the least of your worries, because these things will eat absolutely anything that moves. Um, the adults will eat small crickets and flies if they can catch them. Uh, they'll also kill adult female dubias, which are like five times as heavy as them, uh, without any problem. Uh, the babies will jump on adult crickets and rodeo them until they die from the venom. Uh, they're like absolutely fearless. Um, they'll also try to suck on prey that others have gotten, even if the original owner doesn't appreciate it. Um, and they even find dead prey that has already been eaten and dropped by others and suck on it. Um, or even body parts that fell off. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I call my assassin bug enclosure the uh, murder cube, <laughs> even though it's not actually a cube, uh, because absolutely anything I throw in there gets sucked dry in a matter of minutes. Uh, very entertaining to watch, in my opinion, though also definitely not for everyone. It can get quite brutal. Uh, now, how much should you feed um, with the nymphs? It's quite easy to see. Their abdomen becomes round after a meal, uh, looks almost like a balloon if they've eaten a lot. Um, so just feed them when they've slimmed down a bit. Uh, for the adults, that doesn't happen. So it's harder to see when they're hungry. Uh, as a general rule, you can give them something that's about half their size each week. Uh, so for example, a large cricket or like a half-grown dubia for every animal once a week. Um, They'll also often come out and roam around if they get hungry, so that's also a good tell how much you need to feed. You can feed them from tongs, but you can also just throw the food in there. Um, don't worry, they will find it. Even uh, dubias that normally burrow, they're very good at hunting stuff down. Um, also, that's a lot more entertaining to watch, in my opinion, than just giving them the food straight up. Well, and that's it for husbandry. Really very simple. Now, a few more things about them that you should be aware of. They will breed a lot. Now, they do have sexual reproduction, so you do need males and females, and it's not quite as crazy as some stick insects, but once they get going, you're gonna have babies. A lot of babies. Um, every female will lay around one egg per day, so with five females, you'll eventually get five new nymphs every day. And that's not going to stop for around one to two years, uh, because that's how old they get as adults. You should be prepared for that and have a plan what to do with the babies. The eggs, and this is what they look like, uh, are luckily quite easy to spot and pretty big. So you can take these out and freeze them if it gets too much. Also, don't try to feed the babies to your other animals. Uh, that venom they might have might not be lethal to humans, but it is definitely lead to smaller animals and other arthropods, uh, so don't get the idea to even feed these to anything. 
Um, you can keep the babies with the adults, by the way. Um, cannibalism is very, very rare. I've seen it maybe once or twice and I've had hundreds of these babies at this point. They take around eight months or so to grow up with my temperatures and probably around one year at normal room temperature. Well, and that's it. Hopefully I have convinced you to give these awesome little critters a try. They're really underrated in my opinion and a lot more people should have them. The next video is probably gonna be a collection update because quite a few things have changed. I've got some new animals, um, some very interesting developments with some of them and sadly also some deaths. Anyway, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.